Good morning. <laughs> I'll tell you, this has been a, a blessing in itself, just to be able to see everybody in person. The sixth chapter of Isaiah. <clears throat> in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him, each had six wings. With two, they covered their faces, and with two, they covered their feet, and with two, they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole world is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. Just as God called the prophet Isaiah, God calls us and he can be very persistent. We may try explaining to God that this is not a convenient time for a call. We all offer all kinds of excuses to God too. We say, but God, I like my current job. I have young children still at home. I can't afford it. I simply cannot do that thing. I don't have the right training. I don't have the background, the experience, the education. The excuses can go on and on, and they do. But God has a special job for each and every one of you. Fringe benefits include on-the-job training, impressive growth opportunities, and an extravagant requirement in a unique paradise. Experience is not required, but you will find that all prior experiences that you have will be helpful. There are no age requirements. You're never too young, and, and we're never too old. <laughs> Having physical impairments is really no obstacle whatsoever. And the son of the top boss is in charge of job training and human relations. He will help you obtain the skills and the abilities that you need to accomplish what you're called to do. And although your call will probably not be recorded in the way that Isaiah's is, being chosen by God is an awesome responsibility. Some 700 years before the birth of Christ, Isaiah is serving as a court priest, a position that's probably comparable to today's Senate chaplain. Isaiah's call comes in temple splendor it's preceded by a six wing rustling in the air. And he feels a strange numbness in his lips as he watches the seraph descend with a live coal in its hand. Isaiah's lips are unclean because he, like the rest of his people, had been guilty of deception. God wants Isaiah to speak only the truth of God's word. The live coal is like a fragment of a meteor, and Isaiah knows all at once that his lips are going to be purified by fire. His impurities of speech will be burned away by the seraph that has two wings over the eyes, two wings over the feet. Even the seraph is blinded and rendered impotent by God's holy radiance. Isaiah who would be the prophet and the servant of the Most High, bends his mouth upwards 
as a lover awaiting a kiss, and he closes his eyes. His lips burn with cosmic creative pain. And then the coal is taken from his charred lips. The seraph places the dying ember in Isaiah's hands, and it becomes a common coal. And the seraph returns to the air and the six wing rustle like a gentle breeze through an oak tree, it disappears. Isaiah has not yet proclaimed the word of the Lord. But then from his black lips and his burnt tongue, he begins to speak the words of a poet. Holy, holy, holy words. Smelling the burning flesh of his own face, he goes to his people to speak. More often than not, prophets call us to accountability through a message that we would just as soon not hear. No prophet has ever been known to win a popularity contest. The call of Isaiah excites us because it's stimulating to see somebody that is so dramatically caught up in the purposes of God. God calls all of us to be ministers. It is indeed an honor and a privilege to be called by God and to serve him. The ones that we call by their offices are actually those who give order to our common ministries. An individual suitability and competence cannot always be measured even though testing in interviews, even through testing in interviews, the disciples Jesus chose would be unlikely ministers or unlikely candidates for ministers in today's world, just as they were in their own. In the matter of seeking our calling, the destination is not always clear as we begin our journey. Our calling is by definition an expression of our spirituality, and it occurs in the context of living out our faith. Ways of fulfilling our calling are as varied as the number and the kinds of individuals that are called. Today, most people don't think of their work as a Christian vocation. They refer to it as their profession or their career, or simply their job. For some, their work is a means of making a living, putting food on the table and a roof over their heads. You do not have to be employed or in the service of a church in order to serve God in this world. God expects you to be of service in whatever vocation you choose to follow. Your work, whatever that might be, is also caught up within God's work. In the midst of dejected and lonely existence, a woman I'll call Helen, felt the call of God in her life. Helen had suffered from depression and alcoholism for years. And finally, she was institutionalized for several months. And after being discharged, she was sober, but she was also frightened and lonely. She sat alone in her mobile home in despair, without work or friends, with nowhere to go and nothing to do. She feared that it would only be a matter of time before she would be worse off than before. And with nowhere else to turn, Helen began to pray, hands in her pockets. She felt her car keys and she pulled them out. And at that moment, she knew where God was leading her. I can drive a taxi, she ex exclaimed. Helen organized a taxi service in the little town where no public transportation was available. And many people, especially the elderly, had no way of getting around. Her taxi service 
developed into a fleet of old but reliable cars driven by people much like Helen. The taxis would pick up prescriptions at the pharmacy and they would deliver them. They'd take people to senior citizens activities and they'd take them shopping, enabling many to get out who could only sit at home before. Helen's story reminds us that God is still speaking to us today as God spoke to Hosea in the temple. In such holy moments, ordinary people hear their names called and their lives are given to purpose and direction. God doesn't tell us the rest of the story to begin with. That's where faith comes in. God tells us to walk by faith and not by sight. If we could see the entire picture, faith would be unnecessary. We don't know what may happen next year or even next week. In all likelihood, we would not see a burning bush or even a six-winged seraph when no one of us saw one. We all have a calling, though, to which God has summoned us. God uniquely equips each of us with gifts and graces for the special calling that is ours. And this is how we actively fulfill God's plan for our lives as we work among God's human family members. A friend of mine, or a friend of Adam Hamilton, who's a friend of mine, he's the pastor of Core Church, told me this story one time. At a young age, a friend of his, I think, of the, I don't remember his last name, Rick, felt called to be a Jewish priest, or be, be a Jesuit priest, I'm sorry. And as he pursued the holy orders, he was told that the priesthood wasn't open to him. The reason? He'd been born without a right hand and a forearm, a handicap and condition that would render him incapable of elevating and breaking the communion bread during mass. The Jesuits did welcome him as a monk though, to work with them. While studying for his PhD at New York University, Rick was surprised to learn that several of his classmates were supplementing their incomes by acting in television commercials. This was in the old days when you didn't have to be an established movie star to make a commercial. An average Joe or a Jane could get paid to brush their teeth on national television. Curry was living, at, Curry was his last name. Rick was living in New York City under a tremendous financial strain. And after obtaining approval from his Jesuit superior, he scheduled an appointment to audition for a mouthwash commercial. He thought that he would be wonderful gargling nationally. Arriving at the agency prepared to audition for a mouthwash commercial, he was greeted by a receptionist who burst out laughing at the man with the empty right sleeve. She was sure that her boyfriend had put him up to it as a joke on her. And when Curry assured her that he was in a serious applicant. She replied, please leave. I can't possibly send you upstairs to audition. If I send you upstairs, I could lose my job. And he felt deep hurt and he felt anger. And painful as it was, that moment of looking directly into the face of prejudice changed his life. Nothing had prepared me for that rejection, he said. Two days later, he decided to establish, and, and Adam says this is still in existence, the National Theater Workshop for the Handicapped, which has now, I guess, been in presence for more than about 30 years in existence. This theater experience has been transforming the lives of performers and audiences alike for over three decades. Rick encourages or urged at that time all people to celebrate their differences and to use their imaginations to change the world. Artists, he explained, have the gift of imagination 
and imagination has no physical boundaries. Prophets are like artists, helping us to see what we had been looking at, but we hadn't noticed. Jesus didn't call any rabbis or priests to be disciples. He called laypersons exclusively. God calls disciples from all walks of life to seek justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God. The church is called to equip disciples and to send them into the world to accomplish God's work. Some of you I know, almost all of you I know, have found your ministry among us, while others are searching for ways to use their gifts. Some of you even believe that you don't have any, God, any gifts that God can use. But let me assure you, each and every one of you, that God can use you. God empowers and equips us for the work within the church and within the community. Prayer is important. Take time to pray and to take time to listen. Each one of us is an integral part of the body. God's work in our lives is not entirely contingent on our knowledge or our agreeing to work for God. Throughout your lifetime, God has always been at work within you. Examine your skills. Examine your interests and the needs of the Christian community. And even the needs of the world, each of you is invited to participate in God's work of reconciling the world to its creator God. When holiness comes calling, what will be your response? God is calling you right now with the special job that only you can do. Is your spiritual cell phone turned on? Listen to God's call. One of the advantages and disadvantages of the last three or four years of being a cripple and not getting very far outside my house and particularly the last year when they all of a sudden we discovered Zoom. I've been able to watch you guys. Haven't been present in a lot of your services because I've been preaching from the East Coast of Hawaii, sometimes two or three times a day, depending on where we go. But I always seem to get in on your discussions and, and your talk afterwards. And I've heard of your dedication to the, the Center of Hope your dedication to the needs of one another, your dedications of making a working experience, a worship experience, particularly with our pastors, and the way some of you have grown in your ministry and been alert to saying just the things that God needs us to hear. Having been involved in many careers over my lifetime, a lot of them involved public service, even my last job, I found I was more interested in meeting and helping the needs of my clients than I was taking their money, much to Pam's chagrin sometimes. But I was able to spread the gospel and take part of their lives, talk to them about the problems and counsel with them and just basically share. And looking back, I find that uh, in spite of some of those free times, God's taken pretty good care of us and positioned us to keep reaching out. I watched as you worked on the church, something I really wanted to get over here and physically take part in, and yet I couldn't do it. But I rejoiced at the numbers of you that showed up and helped, and smiles on your faces as you talked about what you'd done together and the decisions you'd come with one another. I've watched some of you fill the holes in your parents' lives, letting them know that they're not alone, that you've strengthened them, you brought them love. I've watched some of you grow remarkably 
in the ministry you brought to this pulpit and sometimes from your kitchen table. I can't tell you how pleased that God is with you for the little things in your life that sometimes you don't even consider to be a response to a call. And yet because of your relationship with your creator God and with the love that that builds within your life and you're willing to reach out and meet the needs of other people and communities and even countries in the world. That's the call that Isaiah heard. That's the call that each of us get individually. And along with the call with, along with Isaiah, we hear the question, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And you can say with Isaiah, here I am, Lord, send me. May he continue to bless us as we grow back from this past year. As we continue to reach out, I'm, I'm going to miss Zoom in a way because I'm going to be limited to the congregations I've worked with, with here due to time differences. But it has made me more in touch with the rest of the world. And I've watched their calls come as I've heard them share and I've heard them speak. And if I've spoken to them and as God has spoken to them, what a joy it is. So as you sit there and you look at the predicaments in your life or the joys in your life or the happiness, think to yourself, what God can I do to enhance this feeling of love that you've put in me? And find yourself in your prayers and in your thoughts and in your testimony saying, here I am, God. Send me. Amen.